Hello, everyone. My name is Julia Van Buren. I am the education trustee for the Sila Foundation Board, and I want to welcome all of you to this month's webinar. Today, we have with us Fred Karlinski, who will introduce to us the history of, US, of the U.S. regulatory system. Fred has nearly three decades of experience in national insurance regulatory law and compliance. He's an adjunct professor of law and risk management, and he chairs the Florida Supreme Court Judicial Nominating Commission. So we're very excited to have him with us today. We do only have one hour and there is a lot of information that will be that will that will we will be that we will be covering today, excuse me. Questions may be asked through the chat. Uh, at the end of the webinar, we will address your questions if there is time remaining to do that. If not, the questions will be addressed after the webinar. Please keep in mind this webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the Foundation Webinar Library within the next week. A link to the recording will be included in your post-webinar survey communication you will be receiving after this webinar. Lastly, I want to thank this month's webinar sponsor, which is Greenberg Trial Rig, and that is Fred's firm. So Fred, take it away, please. Well, thanks very much, um, Julia, and thanks to the Sila Foundation for hosting this webinar. I also would be remiss if I didn't thank uh, some of my colleagues, Kaylee Cox and Tim Stanfield, both of whom are in our Tallahassee office who helped uh, put this presentation together. Let me also thank um, Mary Ellen Hammock and Diana Capes with Sila and the Sila Foundation for the work that they do, not only with these webinars, but on behalf of the industry. The work that we do, and, and I've been a part of SILA for a long time. I serve as counsel for the SILA board and counsel and regulatory trustee for the SILA Foundation. I think the work that we do together with regulators really makes the industry better for all consumers. So thank you all for, for the work you do and your leadership today. So the... Um, presentation today is going to go back and, and talk about the history of U.S. insurance regulation. Um, as many of you know, insurance regulation and, and insurance as we know it today uh, really didn't start in the United States. It started in um, London at Lloyd's uh, Coffee Shop in 1688. But in the United States, uh, Benjamin Franklin, who did quite a few things, as everyone knows, helped found the insurance industry um, in this country in 1752 with the Philadelphia Contributorship for the Insurance of Houses from Fire and Loss. So really the first losses that people were concerned about were um, fire losses. Uh, in 1730, the worst fire in Philadelphia's history, and Philadelphia was one of the largest cities in the United States at the time, uh, the worst fire in Philadelphia's history started in Fishburne's Wharf, a Delaware River structure. Stores burned, and Franklin gave fire safety suggestions to the community after that. In 1752, along with the Union Fire Company and other fire brigades, Franklin formed the Philadelphia Contributorship for Insuring the of Houses from Lost by Fire. They actually provided seven-year policies back then in addition to the work that he did in insurance, as you all know, Benjamin Franklin inviting, invented the lightning rod to deter fires um, of, of structures. Uh, and so uh, that's really the beginning of uh, the insurance industry in the United States. In 1869, the United States Supreme Court ruled that states could regulate insurance sales and issuance. And so that really was the precursor to the modern day uh, structure that we find ourselves in. In the 19th century, life and fire insurance companies began marketing products nationally. And Paul versus Virginia, a, a US Supreme Court case, became a landmark case for states' rights as it relates to the regulation of insurance. Insurance company lawyers in that case argued that their corporations, the insurance companies, should be considered citizens and be covered under Article 4 and the Privileges and Immunities Clause. And so um, the, 
there, there was more court cases and there were more case, court cases relating to the regulation of insurance. In United States versus Southeastern Underwriters Association, uh, the court held, the Supreme Court held that the industry is subject to regulation by the United States Congress. So Southeastern Underwriters overruled, overturned Paul versus Virginia. Southeastern Underwriters focused on whether insurance was a type of interstate commerce that should fall under the U.S. Commerce Clause, as well as the Sherman Antitrust Act, which is one of the reasons why we read and have that antitrust statement. The Sherman Antitrust Act still guides a lot of what we do. The Sherman Antitrust Act was passed into law in 1890, and it outlawed monopolies of any kind. The Supreme Court in Southeastern Underwriters held that insurers that conducted significant portions of their business across state lines actually did engage in interstate commerce. The ruling held that the industry could be regulated by federal law. The US uh, versus Southeastern Underwriters uh, led Congress to enact the McCarran-Ferguson Act of 1945. That act declared that the continued, and I quote, that the continued regulation and taxation by the several states of the business of insurance is in the public interest and that silence on the part of Congress shall not be construed to impose any barrier to the regulation or taxation of such businesses by the several states. That is, at that point in time, you had the um, really uh, imprimatur by the United States Congress to uh, the current state-based regulatory system that we have today. So it really was, at, at that point in time, not only a court um, decision or court decisions that were dictating this, but Congress through McCarran-Ferguson said, um, that's what the law of the land should be. And the thought was that state insurance regulators were able to impose stronger price regulations than the industry would have otherwise accepted. And so um, you go from McCarran-Ferguson of uh, 1945, really to not a lot of action federally um, until 1999. So you have this uh, acceptance that insurance regulation is gonna be state-based. In 1999, you had the passage of the Graham-Leach-Wiley Act or, or GLB. GLB was intended to and does establish a comprehensive regulatory framework to permit affiliations among banks, securities firms, and insurance companies. And it established uh, functional regulation, but it also affirmed that states should regulate the business of insurance. So you really go 55 years or so without any activity at the state level. Then you have GLB and then you have the Dodd-Frank Act which is the Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act of 2010. Uh, that act created the Federal Insurance Office uh, to inform Congress on insurance matters. It's important to note that the Federal Insurance Office was not uh, created to be or intended to be or is a regulator. Uh, but, but FIO um, monitors insurance markets, makes sure that affordable insurance products are made available uh, to the entire public. And it also acts in, as, in an advisory role to the Financial Stability Oversight Council, as well as um, in, in the FSOC's role in providing uh, the uh, TRIA program that's out there. In addition, FIO also uh, monitors insurance industry issues to identify uh, gaps in regulation, it coordinates and develops federal policy on international matters, monitors access to affordable insurance by traditionally underserved communities. But again, it's not a regulator or a supervisor. FIO is also charged with monitoring all aspects of the insurance sector, including identify, uh, identifying in activities within the sector that could potentially contribute to a systemic crisis to the broader financial system. As you all know, um, Dodd-Frank was passed in uh, response to the 2007, 2008 financial crisis and systemic failure was a big topic at that point in time. And through that, you have things like ORSA, um, you know, Form F and, and, and CGAD that have come out of the regulatory uh, monitoring structures that the states 
now have. FIO, in addition to uh, monitoring the aspects of the insurance sector in the United States, also has authority to represent the United States federal government internationally at meetings of the International Association of Insurance Supervisors, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes, as well as similar organizations. That came in response to some states trying to create their own relationships with various foreign governments, which is a role that the United States government would naturally and, and solely play. And, and so um, that was done, I think, in large part in response to that. State regulators, um, either directly or through their NEIC, can present their views of the insurance regulatory community internationally without an issue, but obviously um, FIO has certain authority in that regard as well. FIO was also and is also responsible for issuing several one-time reports as well as annual reports to Congress. FIO released its first um, report, a report on the reinsurance market in 2014. While the report didn't analyze the extent to which reinsurance or any other particular reinsurer could be systemically important, it did conclude that the business of reinsurance is global in scope and that it serves multiple important purposes within the United States insurance sector. The majority of unaffiliated reinsurance purchased by U.S. insurers is obtained from offshore non-U.S. insurers. It also discussed the traditional insurance market. So with that, um, as part of Dodd-Frank, which was passed again in 2010, the Non-Admitted and Reinsurance Reform Act of 2010 was a big part of that. The NRA, as it's more affectionately known, went into effect in July of 2011. In passing the NRA, Congress sought to achieve a simpler and a more efficient system of regulation and taxation of the surplus lines industry, again, not the admitted market, but the surplus lines market, by establishing the insured's home state as the one and only jurisdiction to regulate and tax surplus lines transactions. So again, you still have the state-based system, but you have a uh, creation of the federal government in the NRA that is intended to make uh, the system work uh, in a much more streamlined fashion. Uh, the NRA provides that non-admitted placements will be subject solely to the regulatory requirements of the insured's home state. It provides that only the home state of the insured may require premium tax payment and it, author st it authorizes states to enter into compacts or otherwise established procedures to allocate amongst themselves premium taxes paid to an insured's home state. Uh, another key uh, reform intended by the NRA relates to national standards of eligibility for surplus lines insurers. Two agreements were initially formed by the states after the adoption of the NRA, but since October 2017, both agreements, uh, October of 2017, both agreements really have been vacated and, and set aside. The agreements were the um, NEMA agreement, which was the not admitted Insurance Multi-State Association and the Surplus Lines um, Insurance Multi-State Compact or, or Slim Pack. Um, and, and like I said, both of those really have been abandoned to a system where there just is cooperation amongst um, all 50 states and the taxation and allocation of that taxation for surplus lines insurers. But in reality, when you look at where we've been since McCarran-Ferguson and GLB and Dodd-Frank and the NRA, by and large, the state-based system has remained in place with minor exceptions, including but not limited to um, what went on in, in, in the NRA as it relates to surplus lines, um, admission and, 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 and taxation and allocation of taxation, as well as, as we all know, with um, Obamacare, um, healthcare in large part has been relegated to the federal government. Some may take exception to that, but certain aspects of that certainly are um, at the federal government level versus at the state government level. So let's talk a little bit more now about the US insurance regulatory system. So the insurance uh, regulatory system in the United States uh, last year in 2021 celebrated uh, the 150th year, the anniversary 
of the NAIC. So the NAIC uh, is the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. Some have jokingly said that it stands for no action is contemplated. That is not the case. It stands for the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. But the NAIC is the U.S. standard setting and regulatory support organization created and governed by the chief insurance regulators from the 50 U.S. states, the District of Columbia, and the five U.S. territories. To be clear, the NAIC is not a regulator. It's an entity whose objective is to promote uniformity where uniformity is appropriate. Uh, state legislatures are the public policy makers that establish set broad policy for the regulation of insurance by enacting legislation that provides the framework from a regulatory perspective under which insurance regulators operate. So the NAIC, uh, if you think about it, is somewhat of a standard setting organization, somewhat of an organization that is intended to promote uniformity with things like accreditation and model laws, but ultimately those accreditation type of standards and model laws need to be passed by the individual state legislators. In that regard, there is another organization that we should be familiar with in the arena of regulation and public policy of insurers, and that's NCOIL. Similar to the NEIC, NCOIL crafts model laws and insurance, works to both preserve the state jurisdiction over insurance as established by McCarran-Ferguson um, and to serve as an educational forum for public policymakers and interested parties. Similar to uh, the NAIC, NCOIL has several national meetings over the course of the year. NCOIL uh, is not 150 years old. It was founded in 1969 and it works to assert the prerogative of legislators in making state policy when it comes to insurance and to educate state legislators on current and perennial insurance issues. Again, it acts as a forum to promote uniformity and really as a, a free flow of information to various state legislators around the country who are involved in the legislation of insurance matters within their particular state. In addition, um, similar to the NAIC, there is an organization called the International Association of Insurance Supervisors. The IAIS was established in 1994. And if you think about the NAIC, the IAIS is similar to the NAIC, but on a international uh, basis. It's a voluntary organization of insurance supervisors and regulators. It's an international standard setting body that is responsible for developing and assisting in the implementation of principles, standards, or other supporting material for the supervision of the insurance sector all around the world. The NAIC and its individual member commissioners are all members of the IAIS. The um, FIO and, and, and U.S. Treasury and the um, uh, president of the NAIC and, and other executives from the NAIC have typically been members of the executive committee of the IAS and have played a role in the discussions that take place there. The IAS is governed differently than what we're typically used to in the United States. And so it will be interesting to see the interplay between um, the NAIC, uh, U.S. Treasury, and the Federal Reserve and the IAS moving forward. But clearly the IAIS is an organization that does need to be uh, watched and, 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 and you know, paid attention to over the course of the future because the international community, the world's becoming a much smaller place and the international community is taking a larger role in discussion of insurance regulatory types of issues. So the fundamental reason for government regulation back to the United States now um, is to protect American consumers. That's the fund fundamental reason why the government regulates the business of insurance. Insurance regulation is really centered around several key functions, uh, company licensing, producer licensing, producer regulation, market conduct, financial regulation, and consumer services are really the core elements of that regulation. State insurance departments are tasked with these responsibilities. 
You may have others that get involved in the um, discipline of, of insurers. For example, state attorney generals have gotten more involved. Sometimes consumer service agencies do get involved. But by and large, the elements that I just described earlier are regulated by the various state insurance departments, even though some other governmental apparatuses may take some role in the review of those activities. Uh, the departments of insurance within the individual states oversee the admission of insurance companies into states, approve insurance rates and forms where those are appropriate in most personal lines cases and in most states, personal lines are approved from a rate and form perspective. Commercial lines in a lot of cases has been deregulated, but again, that's on a state by state basis. In addition, the state insurance regulators supervise the market conduct of insurers within their particular state. State laws require insurers and what we call or what we deem insurance related businesses to be licensed before selling products, selling their products or services within a particular state. So to be clear, state licensing is a significant function for state insurance regulators. Insurers or other um, otherwise needing to be licensed entities who fail to comply with regulatory requirements can be subject to licensure, suspension or revocation. Many states exact fines for regulatory violations as well as there are criminal penalties for certain uh, things that are done from an unlicensed perspective in the insurance arena. So you really do need to be mindful of what the laws are as it relates to licensure within an individual state. The um, NAIC has something called the UCAA, which is a uh, process by which applications for admission uh, or starting a new company can be approved. And that process is um, fairly uniform among the states, but there are certain differences, some state specific requirements within each particular state. Um, insurance agents and brokers who are also known as producers must be licensed to sell insurance and must comply with various state laws and regulations governing their activities. When insurance producers operate in multiple jurisdictions, states are required to coordinate their efforts to track producers and ultimately to prevent uh, violations. The National Insurance Producer Registry, or NIPR, which is a nonprofit affiliate of the NAIC and governed by a number of the NAIC um, commissioners, or the, the, the individual state commissioners who are members of the NAIC, the, the, the NIPR was established to develop and operate a national repository for producer licensing uh, information. Let me give you a little clue and a little hint. And some of the registrants will, will shudder when I say this. If you want to show you don't know what's going on in the um, producer registry world, call NIPR Nipper. It really drives certain people crazy. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that because it'll really show you're not that familiar with what's going on in the marketplace. State regulators uh, protect consumers by ensuring that insurance policy provisions comply with individual state laws, are reasonable and fair, and that they don't really have any major gaps in coverage that might be misunderstood by consumers and leave them unprotected. For personal property and casualty lines, about half the states require insurers to file rates and to receive prior approval before rate or policy form filings go into effect. Rates for life insurance and annuity products are not subject to the same regulatory approval, although regulators may seek to ensure the policy benefits are commensurate with the premiums that the insurers ultimately charge within their state. State insurance regulators in the early 90, 1990s developed something called SURF, the System for Electronic Rate and Form Filings. The intent of SURF was to provide a cost-effective method for handling insurance policy rate and form filings between regulators and insurance companies. Just about every state now use SURF, uses SURF for a majority of their rate and form filings. So there is some uniformity in that process. In addition, uh, 
through the work of the collaborative work of insurance regulators, uh, the Interstate Insurance Product Regulation Compact or IIPRC is an important modernization initiative that benefits state insurance regulators, consumers, and those in the insurance industry. Uh, there are 47 compacting states. The compact serves as a central point of electronic filing for certain insurance products, which include um, certain life insurance, annuities, disability income, and long-term care insurance that are reviewed for compliance pursuant to comprehensive and detailed uniform product standards developed uh, by and for and adopted by member states. The compact established a multi-state public entity, the Interstate Insurance Product Regulation Commission, or again, IIPRC, which serves as an instrumentality of the member states. So the member states are all members of the IIPRC. And this really does have the effect of streamlining the process of review of the products that I mentioned. Obviously, those are all um, uh, life and, and disability products. Personal lines on the property side are, are not within that. So individual states would still uh, review auto rates and forms, homeowners rates and forms, workers comp is, is also not in here as well. Um, financial regulation in the United States provides crucial safeguards for America's insurance consumers. The states maintain that the NAIC, the world's largest financial database, and that helps with things like financial examinations, insolvency, liquidations, as well as accreditation of the various states. Market regulation is another pillar of what insurance regulators do. Market regulation attempts to ensure consumers are charged a fair and reasonable um, price for their insurance that they have access and to benefit uh, to, to beneficial and compliant insurance products within their particular state. And they are also um, within the market conduct realm or market regulation realm, a requirement that insurers operate in ways that are legal and fair to uh, the consumers within their particular state. Insurance regulators through the NAIC began the market conduct annual statement or MCAS in 2002 with the goal of collecting uniform market conduct related data. And what I think you've seen over the last couple of years is where there were um, typically financial um, exams that were on a certain um, timetable as well as market conduct exams that were the NEIC through its um, sort of morphing in, in, in terms of what is best for the industry has really gone to a risk focused approach so that MCAS and the market regulation function is more um, risk focused and, and, and risk based than it is um, sort of prescribed as, as it was many, many years ago. Consumer services, every state has a consumer service division and that's one of the pillars again of insurance regulation. The goal here is obviously to protect the consumers of a particular state. There are hotlines and special units for consumers to call in uh, when a company is making some change or doing something, typically best practice is to work with the consumer services division within a particular state, make sure they understand what that company is doing because their phones are gonna light up at, at, at a certain point in time. And there's also consumer information that is available to consumers on the NAIC website, as well as the individual state website. So those types of um, things are really good um, uh, sources of information for consumers. And, and the goal is to have the website obviously ameliorate some of the need for calls into consumer hotlines, but each state does have a consumer hotline and those are typically always activated and they can get more um, staffed higher or lower, similar to the way insurers do if there's some type of a crisis within a particular state or a particular region or a particular line of business. So let's talk a little bit about where we are uh, modern day and talk about what's gone on in the weird world we have all lived in for the last two plus years. And that is some of the regulatory responses to COVID. 
And so state regulatory responses to the COVID pandemic really have been varied across the country. As state and local governments began issuing various degrees of orders requiring businesses to close and for people to shelter in place, regulators were forced to think on their feet and, and to think in terms of something that they had never seen before. But the goal was um, really singularly to make sure that insurance consumers were served and the industry uh, in the insurance industry was able to function throughout that time. So if we look at what went on, for example, in Florida, my home state, um, Florida, from a producer licensing perspective, licenses well over 100,000 agents, insurance agents per year. Generally, Florida requires an applicant to have completed or taught a course in the line they're seeking licensure, to have earned an insurance degree from an accredited college or university, to meet certain uh, specific work experience thresholds in the industry, and to, if you haven't done that, to hold the equivalent license in another state or to earn a certified industry designation. Applicants uh, must be made, uh, make an application to the department uh, and within their form and associated fees must be paid. So the process in the state of Florida is a um, ongoing process. There's a hundred plus new agent um, licenses issued by Florida every year. And they're issued you know, on an ongoing basis. Um, in March of 2020, testing centers and live scan vendors began to close. In response to that need, uh, my good friend, the Florida Chief Financial Officer, Jimmy Petronas, who does a great job, but who also serves as the agency head of the Department of Financial Services, issued Chief Financial Officer Director of 2007 in April of 2020. And that directive allows for the issuance of temporary residential, resident, residential licenses for life and variable annuity contracts, health and personal lines. To receive a temporary license pursuant to directive um, passed, uh, to, 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 to receive a temporary license pursuant to the directive, passing the state licensing examination was not required but all other qualifications are required, including fingerprints, pre-licensing courses, et cetera. The temporary licenses were intended to expire six months after the date of issuance or upon issuance of a permanent license of the same type in class, whichever of those occurred first. Permanent licenses will still uh, remain available for those that meet all of the requirements. Some testing centers and live scan uh, centers began to reopen shortly after this was uh, put in place, uh, providing some relief, but the directive uh, remained in place for some time due to limited capacity. So the goal was to make things easier and make it easier uh, without obviating the need and, and ultimately making this a temporary um, position while it was difficult to meet some of those uh, requirements. Um, the pandemic also presented some unusual challenges for agents and adjusters. Again, if we look at the state of Florida, there was another directive, 2020-01, which waived the physical presence requirement for agents. It extended that until uh, the governor ended the state of emergency for COVID-19. And it also allowed for um, relaxed um, type of requirements for inspections, both for binding coverage and adjusting claims based on health and safety concerns that were borne by um, COVID-19. So I'll, I'll stick with Florida for another second because, and, and I'll move on to some other states, because I think one of the things that we did um, in the workers' comp space is also important. So the state of Florida operates a state risk management trust fund, which effectively is a self-insurance fund that provides workers' compensation coverage, among other coverages, to state agencies and universities, so effectively state employees. The Division of Risk Management is responsible for the management of claims reported by or against state agencies and universities for coverages under this fund. Directive 2020-05, 
required the department's division of risk management to compensate all claims submitted by frontline state employees who have tested positive for COVID-19 as an occupational disease. So there's a presumption there. The directive broadly defines frontline employees as first responders, correction officers, state employees in the healthcare field, child safety investigators, and members of the Florida National Guard. So there is a finite uh, group that this does apply to. But it should be noted that this directive only applies to the Division of Risk Management. Private carriers are not subject to it. This is wholly different from the relationship that the state has with private carriers. In that regard, um, in the workers' comp space, Florida's Office of Insurance Regulation issued memo 2020-05M, which reminded Florida workers' comp carriers that Florida law requires coverage if the employee suffers a compensable injury that arises out of work performed in the course and scope of employment. This was a much softer regulatory response than we saw in other states, and frankly, in my opinion, a much more um, thoughtful approach. Other states, as we'll talk about in the next slide, took a, a, a far different approach. FAR's response was, was effectively deliberate and allows the market to function as needed. California's approach, um, the, the other coast, if you will, was fairly different. California created a rebuttable presumption for all California employees um, that uh, COVID-19 is a compensable injury under California's workers' comp system. Uh, certain things needed to occur to, to, to make that happen, but this is clearly on the other side of, of the spectrum as to what some other states did. Uh, the presumption could apply to an unknown number of claims. Insurers and producers will have to try to get clarity to comply with this order. No doubt policyholders will be looking for guidance and litigation in this situation is largely inevitable. And here you see the um, timeframes on the screen as to when some of these policies were in force. Uh, telemedicine was probably one of the few good things that came out of COVID other than maybe staying home and reconnecting with one's family, which I uh, thoroughly enjoyed by the way. But, but um, access to telemedicine has been one of the most apparent impacts from the COVID-19 crisis. States have taken different approaches, but some of these changes that states have made in the telemedicine world really appear as if they may be permanent. So you have uh, certain uh, uh, state actions on the screen. In Delaware, it removed the in-person requirement for the uh, rendition of medical services. New Jersey enacted legislation that made um, coverage and the delivery of telemedicine um, a, a, a covered type of uh, thing for insurers to, to compensate for. Other states uh, like Louisiana issued emergency rules to provide access to telemedicine during the pandemic. Um, it, it, the Louisiana insurance regulation dealt with telemedicine as well as network adequacy. Another big area where there were, and I wouldn't say there was complete uniformity here, but probably more uniformity than, than in other areas was in the, uh, in the prescription uh, coverage area. Uh, patient accent, access to prescription drugs received a great deal of attention during the pandemic. Uh, here on the screen, you see what Colorado did relating to a bulletin uh, issued by Governor Polis uh, on access to prescription drugs during the COVID emergency. Uh, in Nevada, they had a waiver of their formulary. Texas uh, passed emergency rules that were allowed for early refills out of network ph pharmacy, as well as home delivery under their statute. And so you had um, varying types of responses, but by and large, everyone understood that there needed to be certain accommodations as it related to, um, as it related to prescription drugs. One of the impacts of shelter in place relating to automobile insurance, uh, one of the impacts of shelter in place orders was that businesses converted to remote work almost instantaneously in that 
Friday in, in March in 2020. And there was an overall reduction in driving mileage because of that people weren't driving to work. In some cases, people weren't driving to school. Uh, there's also data to in, indicate that people that were still driving were speeding because roads were empty. So, you know, what you giveth, you take it away. You, you, you have less traffic on the street, but you have more um, fatalities and, and, and accidents, pr pr uh, primarily because there are fewer people and people are speeding. Uh, many state regulators, uh, based on what was going on in the auto market in terms of driving, decided that automobile policyholders needed premium relief due to reduction in exposure from lockdowns. Alabama issued a bulletin that urged auto carriers to offer premium reductions, much like Florida's workers' compensation guidance. Um, this wasn't mandated. It was a suggestion. Uh, California issued in April of 2020 uh, an order to require auto carriers to provide premium refunds to affected customers within 120 days. The bulletin does not define um, how cu customers would be affected. So by and large, it's, it's a broad swath. Uh, Maryland took a different approach. It allows policyholders to request a premium modification for out of service vehicles. Um, and, and, and so that those were some of the things that we saw states do over the course of time based on COVID. Now, what I'd like to do, even though COVID is still going on and, and one could easily say it's an emergent insurance regulatory issue is I'd like to talk about uh, a number of other emergent insurance regulatory issues that are happening today as we speak. So the first is cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is a huge issue for everyone on this Zoom. Cybercrime and hacking are, are really nothing new, but since the onset of the pandemic, cyber attacks have accelerated at an unbelievable pace. And that's because more people are working from home. There are less safeguards and protocols in that um, work from home space. And you, know, you never wanna see what's now on the screen, on your screen. Your files are encrypted, your photos, documents, and other important files have been encrypted with a unique key granted for this con computer. Cybersecurity, um, uh, ransomware attacks, those types of things really are um, probably the, 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 the one thing that the insurance industry and all financial services types of disciplines, as well as you know, our global community as a whole, really share in common and really, it's, it's been very difficult to get that under control. So there's been guidance by CISA and others to try and, and other federal entities to try and establish um, certain protocols. But at the end of the day, um, cybersecurity remains probably our biggest uh, individual threat and our biggest national safety threat. Individual state actors, other nation state actors, are um, interfering with the cybersecurity of, of the United States and the businesses within the United States. I'm sure our government is doing the same thing overseas as well, but ransomware attacks and those types of things need to be dealt with very, very specifically. So while it's beyond the scope to go through that in large detail within this presentation, I would urge you if you've not spent a lot of time understanding what's going on in this space, to do so because it really is something of a shared responsibility for all of us. And it's something everyone needs to understand, especially those in the insurance industry. Um, data privacy regulation is another big issue out there. Um, despite evidence of what many would consider inadequate data protection practices, unlike other countries or, or other um, uh, unions, if you will, like the European Union, the U.S. does not have a uniform, comprehensive data security law. Instead, there are targeted policy responses at the federal level, which many times compete with state um, regulatory laws relating, re relating to data privacy. This uneven patchwork of laws and the regulations related to data security can be problematic for companies that do business in the United States. Companies are forced to comply with often contradictory and sometimes competing 
requirements. That makes it pretty interesting. The U.S. government generally has approached privacy and security by regulating only certain sectors, such as the health and financial sectors, and certain types of sensitive information, information relating to children or information relating to education or something like that. The rules that govern health information are an example of the U.S.'s industry-specific approach. So, for example, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, which is the United States' primary, primary health policy and security law, only applies to covered entities holding protected health information, or PHI. FERPA, in turn, intersects with and sometimes interferes and conflicts with the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, which protects the data of children under the age of 13. So you have these various um, laws at the federal level or acts at the federal level that are industry specific versus comprehensive. The NEIC's Insurance Data Security Model Law 668 and its intended uh, or, or, or your complementary regulation seeks to establish data security standards for regulators and insurers in order to mitigate the potential damage of a data breach. The law applies to insurers, insurance agents, and other entities licensed by the state departments of insurance. The US Treasury has urged prompt action by states to adopt the NAIC insurance data security model law within um, a few years, or the view is that the administration may ask Congress to preempt the states in this area. That's been an ongoing dance out there. Certain states have passed these regulations and laws, others have not, and it'll be interesting to see if there is any state or federal reaction to that ultimately in future years. Um, talk a little bit about an issue that hits pretty close to home here. Um, if you're looking at me and you're seeing out uh, my window here, um, and, and just over the bridge, if you will, is Miami Beach. As I'm sure everyone recalls, um, about six months ago, June 23rd, a condominium tower in Surfside, Florida, collapsed, killing 98 people. It took four first responders over four weeks to clear 14,000 tons of debris and to find the remains of the victims. The investigation of the cause is ongoing. A judge has appointed a receiver to administrate claims, to administer claims for damages that will run surely into uh, very large numbers. This tragedy will require attention from state legislators, specifically in Florida this year. Issues relating to insurance coverage, building codes, inspections, condominium associations, and developments will be some of the issues that will be examined in relation to condos during the upcoming Florida session and in any state where there are condominium associations. PREA, the Pandemic Risk Insurance Act of 2020, was something that the insurance industry hoped to get the um, attention of Congress uh, early on in the pandemic. It would have established uh, the Pandemic Risk Insurance Act of 2020, PREA, would have established the Pandemic Risk and Reinsurance Program within the Department of Treasury. The bill would have been similar to um, TRIA in that it would be um, establishing a share of insured losses that the program would cover, conditions for payments of insur to insurers, caps on liabilities, and the amount that insurers must annually pay in deductibles for this coverage. The bill also provided for the treatment of existing business interruption insurance policies and state residual market insurance entities. Those um, pieces of legislation relating to PRI and other federal um, responses to COVID did not pass. And so you really have no federal regulation relating to insurance as it relates to um, any type of risk sharing mechanism or otherwise as it relates to COVID. COVID has also caused disputes over business interruption insurance around the world. Those disputes primarily focus on the requirement of most business interruption policies that physical damage to the property occur in order for there to be a valid claim. Uh, proposals were filed in Congress to address and, and change the view of this issue, but none of them ultimately became 
law. There were a number of different things out there, uh, but as I mentioned, none of them became law. And, and I don't know um, what the general sense is, but my sense is that this issue has somewhat waned since we have gotten past COVID and there have been court decisions on business interruption matters in, in many of the states out there. Uh, NFIP and the federal insurance uh, program is another hot topic now in DC and all around uh, coastal communities. The NFIP provides about 1.3 trillion in coverage for more than 5 million policyholders in 22,500 communities across the nation. Uh, FEMA uh, has updated the pricing methodology for the NFIP to communicate flood risk more clearly so policyholders can make more informed decisions about purchasing adequate insurance and as well as mitigating actions to protect against the perils of flooding. Uh, this update is the first update to pricing in about 50 years. There was an effort um, earlier, um, uh, the, the Bigger Waters Act that ultimately uh, went forward and then was um, repealed. And so uh, pricing really has not been something that's touched uh, by Congress as it relates to the NFIP and flood. The most pressing problem, not surprising, is rate inadequacy. The current methodology that's used does not adequately take into account the amount that would be necessary to repair a particular product or a particular property. There's more data now than when the current methodology was used. And inadequate rates at the NFIP have led to um, the NFIP operating in a significant loss with Congress having to rescue it over and over again. So it, it, it's been dubbed risk rating 2.0, equity in action. The new system provides actuarially sound rates that are in the words of the promoters of it, equitable and easy to understand. In developing these new rates, FEMA coordinated with subject matter experts from the uh, US Army Corps of Engineers, uh, the US Geographical Survey and National uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration along with experts from across insurance industry and actuarial science disciplines to ensure alignment with federal regulation systems guidance and policies. Um, in addition, now going into the healthcare arena, Congress included uh, the No Surprises Act as part of the 2.3 trillion omnibus spending bill that was passed for COVID relief at the end of 2020. Starting in 2022, patients will enjoy protections against surprise billing as well as new transparency tools as it relates to the provision of health services within the individual states. The act seeks to protect patients from the worst of balanced bills for emergency services, which include things like air ambulances. Patients that are treated by an out-of-network provider will only be responsible for the same amount of cost sharing that they would have paid if the service had been provided by an in-network provider. Providers and facilities are prohibited from sending balanced bills to patients to collect a higher amount. That's obviously huge. In July of 2021, uh, HHS, Labor and Treasury, and the Office of Personal Management issued an interim final rule that began implementation of the No Surprise Act. That interim final rule, among other things, uh, banned surprise billing for emergency services. They must be treated as in-network services. Bans high out-of-network co out cost sharing for emergency and non-emergency services. Bans out-of-network charges for ancillary care at an in-network facility, bans other out-of-network charges without advance notices. Um, so it's really pretty comprehensive in dealing with, in large part, balance billing type of issues. Um, recent federal legislation has changed the structure of the Medicaid drug rebate program, the MD, MDRP. That program provides a significant offset to Medicaid drug spending it lifts cap, current caps on rebate amounts as well. There are currently other proposals being considered by Congress as they relate to prescription drugs. There's a penalty of issues out there now that would change 
um, the way those are uh, being priced out there in the marketplace, specifically some relating to the conduct of PBMs or pharmacy benefit uh, managers. And we have a chart on the screen that shows some of the examples of what is being looked at um, in some of those pieces of legislation. Uh, last um, summer, in relation to uh, the George Floyd um, case, the NAIC, and, and other things for that matter, uh, the NAIC formed the Special Committee on Race and Insurance. It's the first time ever um, any uh, NAIC committee was requested by every single commissioner of the NAIC to, um, to join. And so every commissioner, every department is a member of the Special Committee on Race and Insurance. The committee was initially co-chaired by um, the media past president uh, of the NAIC, Director Ray Farmer of South Carolina, who, um, who, who started the special committee, and it was co-chaired by last year's NAIC president, um, uh, Commissioner David Altmaier from the state of Florida. The committee has done a number of things. It is looking at the and analyzing the level of diversity and inclusion within the insurance sector. The NAIC hired its first uh, head of diversity and inclusion. For those who have not met her, she's a great person who's going to do great things at the NAIC. The committee also is intending to engage with a number of stakeholders in this area to examine and determine which current practices or barriers exist in the insurance sector that potentially disadvantage people of color or hist and or historically underrepresented groups, as well as um, the, the committee is intended to make recommendations to the executive committee. So the NEIC really has um, tried to lead by example here and, 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 and understands that this issue is one that is long overdue and needs to be tackled. And we'll continue that dialogue um, this year, certainly, and in my opinion, well into the future. And with that, um, we are almost out of time, but obviously you can see that the history of insurance regulation in the United States, as well as where we are today in terms of a penalty of issues while some may say it's boring, I say it's pretty interesting, and I'm glad we've had this hour to spend together. For those that may uh, want to talk about this geekish issue further, uh, my contact information is on the screen. Unfortunately, we won't have any time for questions, but feel free to reach out to me at any point in time at karlinskyf at gtlaw.com. Again, karlinskyf at gtlaw.com. Again, to my team at Greenberg Traurig, to the SILA Foundation and SILA team, and to Julia, thank you very much for putting this together. And now, Julia, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you, Fred. I want to thank Fred and his entire team for putting this on. This was very valuable information, and it's information that anybody in compliance or regulatory does need to be aware of. I also want to send out a thank you to Greenberg Traurig for sponsoring this webinar. As you know, these webinars do come to you for free. We do not charge for them. So uh, we're very grateful for all the donations and support we receive for these webinars. And, and if you are looking to make a donation in 2022, please consider the SILA Foundation. Um, other than that, I want to thank everyone else who joined us on the call. All of you, I hope you have a great afternoon, and thank you. With that, I will bid you adieu. Goodbye. <laughs>